Greetings from Alaska. This is Fred Roll, Curry Young Tribal Council member from Dillingham, Alaska. Sorry, I was checking some notes here. Um, so, what I want to share with you today um, is an email I got a, a, just last week. Uh, what I try to do, just so everyone's aware, I, I read your emails repetitively. So, uh, because I've been through some things, I, I, I relive it in my mind, the person's experience, so I could better explain it to you guys. Um, it's just how my mind works. I, I, I look at things from all sides kind of deal. I, I don't know. Maybe it's OCD and I don't know it. So, <clears throat> now, this happened on the Yetna River, right? Which is just, it's, it's north a little ways going towards Fairbanks. Um, the exact place down the Yetna, uh, I was asked to leave that part out of it. Um, we'll say the Yetna River, okay? Now, where this particular incident occurred, it, it was approximately three years ago. Uh, it was at the end of caribou hunting. And they were, they were back up in there doing trout fishing. Uh, they had a canoe, but most of the time it, it was at a narrow part of the river. They would drag it, right? Now, it wasn't the main Yetna. It was, it, let me let me specify, it was, a, it was a, a glorified river creek that fed into the Yetna. And it was, it was fairly shallow, fairly narrow, just, and the trout were in some deep pockets, and that's where they were going for them. So, they end up park in their boat, their their canoe, they get out and they walk along the grassy edge on either side of this creek. Now, uh, when they get to the point to start fishing, initially there's two of them, and as the day goes on, because they were there for three days before this incident occurred, so they were basically repeating the same thing they had been doing for a couple days, going to this little honey hole for pan frying trout, and loving it, right? They're having a great time, they had a successful hunt. They're, you know, that's living the dream. You got your caribou meat for the winter. Now you're going to go, man, lay into some trout, cook them over and over. Ah, oh, it doesn't get much better. So they're doing their thing. They got their little thing, you know, they got a little rhythm down with their movements and stuff. And their third buddy shows up and he was in hip waders and he had just kind of sloshed on through the water and took his time hiking around on some of the game trails to get back to where they were. They were very comfortable where they were at. Uh, there had been nothing out of the ordinary, n not during the caribou hunt, none of it. They, they were just having a great old Alaskan experience. They're all local, okay? Um, just has to leave that out because where they happen to live is a very small place. So I'll respect that. Now, as they were, they were talking across this little creek, it's not very wide, and there's this one particular honey hole where there was some old... Uh, either alders or willows that had been broken and, and it kind of quasi hung down by this little creek. Now, right off the side of this little glorified river creek, uh, it was about 10, 12 feet to where the, the alders and the willows got thick. So you had tall grass on either side and some scrub brush and some berry bushes and stuff. And, and at this particular spot, there was these willows or uh, alders. They it was poplar or something. They, they they didn't go and inspect. It was about thirty feet from them where these these branches and stuff were going off into the water, and just towards them from that little blockage or hanging over the water, it created a shadow in the water, and and the trout would pocket up in there in a relative safety, right? So they're doing their they're they're doing the fly fishing thing, you know, instead of just walking up the creek and scooping them out with a, a net, they were they were fishing. So they're doing their thing. He's working his fly rod. And as he's working it, his buddy on the opposite side is trying to time him. So, you know, he his while his fly lands and then he's pulling it back, the other guy's trying to land his fly and pull it back. You know, they're trying to, they're just dicking around. They're just being guys, just doing stupid shit. And so they're having fun with it and they're laughing because eventually they, they started laughing at each other because it was going really well. And then all of a sudden they got tied up. And so, you know, they reel, you know, they reel in so... They're closer together and they can un unlatch the line. Now, they're on opposite sides of this not very wide creek. Uh, it's about three times as wide as the canoe, so you're looking at six, seven feet wide. You know, not very wide at all. So they're kind of reaching out, flinging the, their lines to untag them. They, they got boots on, but they're just, they're dicking around. They were young. So, well, early 20s. 
So they're doing their thing. Third guy who had on chest waders goes around. Uh, we'll call him guy number one. Uh, okay, let, let's call him Chris. Uh, the guy across the creek, we'll call him Doug. And, and we'll call uh, the guy in the hip or chest waders, we'll call him Fred. Okay, just keep it simple. So Chris, Doug, and Fred, right? Okay. So Fred goes around him and is going up to check out that blockage. And he's laughing. He goes, I'm going to see if I could, you know, uh, massage one's belly and fling it out of the creek. You know, he was going to, you know, check his skills out, see if he could do it, you know. And so he goes over and he starts moving the brush that was stuck in there. And he was like, is there beavers around here? And he holds up one of the branches and it's frayed and broken. It wasn't chewed off like a beaver. Anyone ever see a beaver chew? If you haven't, Google it. It's very distinct. You can't mistake it for anything else. There was no beaver chew mark. So... They're like, what the, he's like, what the, that's weird. It's almost like someone, someone must have did this on purpose to make a little shadow area for the fish, right? He goes, okay, I get it. So he stops destroying it. He respects the fact that, oh, someone intentionally did this, and that's why we're able to fish for these trout right here. Because it, it's given them a sense of safety in the shade and the shadow from hawks and whatever, you know? So he's like, oh, okay. He, he fixes it. And he backs out. He gets out of the creek and, and he goes, okay. He recognizes he was about to destroy something that, that worked for somebody and it could be potentially feeding him or whatever. So he backs up on the bank and they got their lines untied and stuff. And as they're discussing what they're going to do, kablook, they hear something hit the water. And they're like, well, who else is nearby? Because where they were staying... You have to follow this creek that back or river back down to where it meets the the Yentna, and then you got to go back up river to where they were camping, where the cabin was, where they were at, right? So they're a little ways away from the cabin, remote as hell. And so as they're they're sitting there discussing who who could possibly be throwing rocks in the creek, you know, and that type of thing, you know, who would, who would want to do that? Uh, one of them was armed. Only one of them had a uh, twenty two pistol for spruce grouse. Our, our small game bears weren't on their radar uh, they weren't it, it just wasn't it didn't feel like a threatening environment nothing had happened so they felt eh, we don't need a gun N nothing big we got 22 we'll make noise it'll run whatever it is so periodically rocks drop rocks drop and they're it's starting to get to the point where they're they're looking because they're figuring they would see the rocks flinging in like this but these things were coming almost straight down so whoever was throwing them was throwing them real high so they'd come straight down in the water, right? So they catch on to this and they start looking in what they thought would, you know, be the direction they were coming, trying to figure out. Well, as they're doing this, uh, Fred, uh, in the chest waders, he gets hit with one of these rocks and he gets hit in the back of his chest waders, right? And he heard it hit, didn't really feel it too much because they were really baggy. They kind of balloon out on you with the straps anyway. So he didn't really feel the impact, but he heard the thunk against the neoprene. And he was like, hey, something, one of those, whoever it is just hit me in the back with it. So they all turn around to look the direction that he got hit in the back from. Now, as they're doing this, behind them, they hear that canoe rip out of the water. Just, if you can imagine that, just a, a canoe leaving the water really fast. And they all whip around to see what the, you know, what the hell is this? All they catch is a dark figure halfway into the tree line and the canoe just, boom, impacting into the brush. Now, this all happened very fast, very fast. A whoosh sound, they whip around, things already halfway in the trees, canoe's landing, right? Just, just like that. And they're immediately like, what the, what the hell is this? Because all the shit that was in that canoe is now raining down and decorating the opposite side of the creek where their canoe is now got a new home resting in the alders. Uh, they didn't know what the hell to do. They were stuck. They, they were stuck. And, and they were trying to make out, what did we see cut into those trees? What the, what was that? Bigfoot, hairy man, none of that was even on their radar. They never entertained the thought, ever. And I asked him, when I was talking to him about his experience, I said, well, 
what was your knowledge of, of the hairy man or Bigfoot before this? He was like, ah, you would, you'd hear stuff, but he was like, I never looked at that crit. That was garbage. There's no way I was going to rot my mind with that, you know, he called it hillbilly bullshit. And I was like, oh, okay. So, to continue on, no prior experience with these kind of things. So, uh, they're, they're, they're stuck. They're, they're looking at each other, but none of them have the words. None of them have the words to uh, get out and express how they're feeling. They, it, was, it wasn't like PTSD traumatizing, but they were in a, a certain level of shock. I can imagine you're in the middle of nowhere. Don't believe in this thing. All of a sudden, kaboosh, your canoe goes flying and you see a dark figure going into the trees. Canoes are not light. This was a 16 foot marine grade canoe, a Coleman. Those things weigh, uh, geez, almost 200 pounds just in of themselves. Plus it was loaded with cooler gear, all, all this stuff. You know, this was their little base camp when they got away from the main camp. Because they would spike camp along the Yetna River and stuff. Anyway, so they, they had some stuff in there. It wasn't just some empty, lightweight thing. This thing was flung a good 30 feet. So they finally start figuring out uh, 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 stuttering type stuff. And uh, uh, oh, hold on one second here. Sorry about that. I had... Uh, Accept a call from one of the elders in Kalignik. I'm uh, attempting to get clarification on that oral history about the hairy men in the pit that uh, turned out to be a woman, you know, just to get some clarification on that. Anyway, so these guys are obviously freaked. Their canoe went for a freaking ride, and they're, they're kind of stuck on stupid on the opposite side of this creek uh, uh, because once this stuff went down and the rocks were being thrown, uh, Doug on the opposite side of the creek from uh, Chris and Fred got on to the other side of the creek uh, during the rock throwing before he got hit in the back and the canoe went for a ride. So then being on on the same side, they all look at each other. Uh, Doug is the one that had the, the little twenty two pistol for the, the shrub grouse or whatever, the spruce chickens. And they, they immediately recognized we need to freaking go. They were not going to go and retrieve that canoe because it was in the direction, quasi in the direction of that big whatever in the hell that just was. And they weren't having none of that. So they start backing out of there just real paranoid, understandably so. Uh, the, all their fun and games just went out the freaking door on a canoe ride into the shrubs, right? So... <laughs> They immediately recognized the, the threat that there was, uh, the way Chris had explained it to me was it was a very unspoken threat. It, 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 it was, it, he, I asked him, it was, did it seem like it was in the air? And he said, kind of, he, that was the closest kind of analogy he could come up with too. So they start backing out of there. They're going back down this little river glorified Creek, whatever, to get to the Etna and then hike back up to the cabin. Um, and they were motivated. Uh, they, they were trying not to panic because they didn't want to spark any kind of uh, predator flight chase kind of thing. So they get down to the Yetna. And just as they meet where this, this glorified river connects with the Yetna to cut up because the trail kind of cuts off the point and then drops down onto the bank of the river. And then kind of cuts up onto the bank and then back down as you're going back up the river. Just because brush will hang out too far and then you go around it and it just over time becomes a game trail or whatever. So they're doing this number. And just as they get around onto the Yetna and they're starting down the bank a little bit, to, you know, trying to discuss a little more because they're snapping out of their shock of what the hell threw a canoe like that, you know. And and they're they're talking, all, well, it couldn't have been a bear. Could a bear do that? They, they were debating the bear thing, right? Which is understandable. They had no other reference, right? So... As they're starting to get up onto the bank to go around this bundle of shrubs to get onto the other side of the bank and continue going towards the cabin, uh, they heard a series of grunts and screams. Uh, he, he, he said he couldn't even put it into words, but it, a woman being murdered is a close, a close sound and uh, like a lion roar type deal, but same time. And so they're immediately even more motivated now because after this scream sounds uh they hear something paralleling them just behind them in the tree line but it's catching up fast right 
big impacts in the ground. Thump, thump, thump. And they're, they're like, oh, shh. So Doug, with the twenty two, shoots two times in the air just to make noise. Bang, bang. Once he did that, the movement came even faster. And it passed them out of, just out of view. They're seeing trees and stuff shake. So they're, they're on the riverbank. Oh, I get ew. I, I can imagine that just, oh, geez, visceral. Crashed through there, and they said it sounded like a, a bulldozer uh, going 80 miles an hour through the trees. Because it sounded like it was the biggest thing around, and it was making a large show of whatever the hell it was doing. And as it got a little bit of ways away, they heard the crashing circling back a little further distance away. So they snap out of it. And they said, okay, we need to get moving. Since it's moving back this way, let's go that way and get to the cabin. So they're doing their thing. They're doing this little jump up the bank, follow the trail, get down on the river bank again. That guy, you know, because that's how it is. You got shrubs hanging over. You're not going to take a swim. And, you know, anyway, so they're, they're doing what they have to do to get the hell out of Dodge. Doug's in the rear with this 22, and he had no confidence in it. After hearing that, whatever it was, crashing and banging through the woods, he knew that he'd be better off shooting Chris or Fred in the knee to get away, you know. So they get to a point to where uh, the trail cuts up onto the bank and then it goes up this rise past some tundra and some muskeg and some black spruce and then comes back, the trail cuts back down to the river and there's uh, four large rocks or something like that kind of offset of each other. I had to get back across the Yentna at that point to get to their cabin about another mile or so up the river, right? <laughs> so they go up the rise, and they get to the point to where the tundra and the black spruce meet, the muskeg or whatever. And they get to that point, and they decide they're going to look back because the whole time there was noise going on, but it stayed in that general area when it circled back, and they, they made their move, you know? So they're trying to, they're at a higher rise, uh, raised area, and they're trying to get a vantage point to make out what is doing this, you know, because they felt they're at a safe distance. So as they're standing up there, they uh, they get the idea because once they got and actually turned and started looking in that direction, all that all that show or whatever was going on stopped, dead silence, right? So Doug again said, "Well, I'll shoot one more time in the air." And he had, he had reloaded at this time. He had taken out the two dead ones, put in two fresh ones. It was just a little six shot, you know, single six, little Ruger, single action. Any hunter out there knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? So he goes, I'm going to put one in the air and see if we can get a reaction out of it and get a look at this thing, you know, because this was a good, at this point, they're, they're looking down into the trees and it's a good 150 yards away and they felt very confident that they could just, get out of there and have enough room to move anyway and make a move or defend themselves whatever so okay yeah yeah do it do it we'll keep an eye out so they're looking bang they shoot in the air right the direction they have to go because they came up a trail with the tree line on the left they come up the rise the tree line still on the left it curves around and goes back down to the yentna well, now the ruckus is coming down where the trail meets the river where they got to go in the trees just basically behind them when they shot. So they're looking over here. Bang! Where's it at? Oh, it, it's down here behind us doing the same shit now. So they don't, they don't know what the hell to do. I, I wouldn't either. So they, they went off-roading, so to speak. They started beelining across the tundra to the next little uh, black spruce across the way. And what their plan was, was to get the frick out of there, get a, get it, get some clear tundra between them so they could see, you know, where it's moving because they didn't see it move in the trees to get back behind them, basically. Now, it wasn't directly behind them. It was kind of offset back to their right, but it's still behind them, and they didn't hear it. Yeah. They get across the way there. And from what he was telling me, when they got across there, he was he was having a, a panic attack. Uh, he he had dealt with childhood asthma, and, and this it felt like a very bad asthma attack. So he had to uh, kind of meditate because he hadn't used an inhaler in years, right? So he's trying to calm himself down. He's on his knees. 
uh, Fred and the chest waiters, he now has the twenty two pistol. Doug is relieving himself in the trees, right? So they have no game plan. They just left their game plan of follow the trail, get get back to the cabin across the Yetna. They, they, they weren't having a good time at this point. So uh, Doug finishes his business, comes back out. He wants the pistol back. And Fred said no. Uh, he goes, I got it. Don't worry. And that way you don't have to be the one in the, in, in the rear. I'm a little bigger than you. You can be in the, you could lead the group. You know, we'll keep Chris between us or whatever. And we'll, we'll, we'll make our go. So they, they come up with the game plan. We'll follow this tree line down. Because they're, they're at like a V-shaped wedge the, to their left, down in that tree line over there about 60 yards or so, was where the ruckus happened behind them when they shot at the top of the rise. Now, they're going down to their right, so it, it's a wedge shape. So, noise over here, they're over here, they want to get down here and look for another way to cross further up the river. They want to continue to the cabin, rightfully so. So, they work their way down, just, just edging the tree line, you know. And uh, as they're going along, uh, the high bush cranberries uh, happen to be in season, and they had this weird odor to them. If you've ever been out in the bush, Alaska, you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of not a musty, but uh, it, it doesn't smell appealing. We'll, we'll put it that way. And so they're catching this whiff of it, right? And they're, they're about half the distance they have to cover to make it down to the end because they're not moving fast. They're moving, stopping, and listening. Now, Fred having the gun... He's, he's a little bolder, don't know why, it's only a 22, but because he had the gun, it, it was a mental uh, a mental thing for him. So he's a little bit further away from that tree line as they're paralleling each other going down. He's there, he's about 10 feet away, and he's stepping in the tundra and the marsh and stuff. Just They're making their way down. Well, what, what Chris and Doug didn't know was Fred wanted to try to shoot it. That That's what he learned later, right? So... Uh, he's thinking he's going to get him a wild man, drag it in, make money or something. They, he found this out once they made it to the cabin. Anyway, so they're doing their thing, and, and this guy's bold with the twenty two for no reason. And, and, and he doesn't realize the danger he's putting everyone in with this garbage. So it, they they make their way down. They get down to the Etna. Now, they, they were looking and paranoid and saw nothing move, right? However, at that particular side of the Etna River... There's about a three foot river bank that you you can see down to the to the edge, but you can't see that three foot. It's it's shielded, you know. Well, unbeknownst to them, this thing had dropped down to the river, and crawled, and was now in the trees over paralleling them, just as they were getting down to the Etna River. So this thing is 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 didn't give a shit about the gunshot. Actively intimidating them and following them, okay? Uh, not a good combination. Doesn't stir happiness and joy and friendship to me. So, uh, they, they, the realization of what the, you know, what the hell is going on came when... Uh, now, remember, Fred's to the outside of them. You got uh, Chris and then Doug. So, they, they kind of make like a triangle shape if you were to look down. You know, if you're looking down at them, you got the tree line. Doug, Chris... Fred. They they once they hear the noise and the grunt, they all turn to their right into the tree line, and on this tree line, it's more broken and open. So you have a a, a stunted growth black spruce, and then you have some willows next to it. A little more sporadic growth versus the denser on the opposite side where they just left their their trail. <coughs> now. They, when they recognized that danger, because they, they were just getting down to the river, right? So this tree line, the way, it, as it comes down the river, understand there's a distance of about uh, 15, 20 feet between the river bank and where the tree line starts again, right? But you have all these little scrub alders and willows that line both sides of everything around, you know? And so they're oriented where... Off their right shoulder, they're kind of like at the apex of where they got to turn and, and start back up and find another way across. But now this thing is pretty much in front of them, and it's, it starts doing the pacing thing again. They turn around and, and take the riverbank back to cross those four rocks to get across the river, right? 
So they're able to do that. They're, he said everything was kind of a blur because I asked him, well, okay, you're telling me that it was off following you, paralleling you, but yet you were at the, the apex of the turn and, and then it started moving. He goes, I realized when we were coming down, it actually paralleled us because we kept hearing stuff. And then it came to a head when they got down to that turning point. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, that, that makes more sense. So now they've backtracked and they get across the rock. Now they still hear the movement right over there. Now when they get across these rocks and get up on the other side, they're, they're, they're feeling a sense of relief. Now they got a, a natural barrier, a little wider than that little creek. And they can, you know, they know they're on the right side of the river to get to the cabin. And that, that was their motivation. So now Fred with the pistol... He's standing on the riverbank, and and he had a false sense of security with this river dividing them, right? So this Yahoo puts around into the trees. Uh, he shot high, but from what Chris said, he had a look of like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw it out, you know, kind of thing. He shoots he shoots high into the trees. It, it, that wasn't smart. Scream, loud scream. And in view from where they, they came across the tundra a little further up the rise and then came down this way and then came back and then crossed the creek. They had an open view of that little wedge shape. They, they first shot over to their right and it was down here behind them. They ran across the tundra this way and came down the left side. You know what I mean? So they had a, a view of this like wedge shaped alleyway going up the rise. This thing screamed, broke some trees and stuff on its way out of that tree line and ran across in front of them going towards where the whole shebang started further down the river. So this thing was actually leaving the area. Smart Fred starts trying to pop shots at it as it's running because he, he just sees it, freaks it, bam, 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 starts feathering it, right? Dumb thing to do. This thing immediately hits the tree line that it was running to because it was moving fast. Hits the tree line. You hear a bunch of breaking and stuff, and they could see the tops of the black spruce and, and some of the birch just, just whipping down hard. So this thing was smashing this shit down to the ground, and they, they immediately turn and start running. Now, as they're running, they're yelling back, you dumbass, you know, they're, they're cursing Fred out because Fred just started winging shots at this thing. It, it was just, it wasn't necessary. It, they, they were in survival mode. Let's get out of here. So after winging the shots, they're running, and they start hearing splashing in the river now Fred just emptied the six rounds Doug is in the lead a good distance ahead of Fred because he was an idiot and stood behind he has a 22 ammo so he, he's got an empty gun he's got a paperweight right and he's the last one in line and he was the one winging shots at this now they're haul ass and, and this particular part of the trail was pretty well worn and they knew it well they've been going back they've been going on it forever so they knew their way and they, they were hauling ass right and they hear it paralleling them in the river. Now, where the cabin is, is on a bit of a rise, and it, it's a single it's a single room cabin. Uh, he said it's approximately 12 by 20, right, uh, on the dimensions of this cabin. Uh, seven foot walls, uh, cathedral-like ceiling, yeah, it, just a shell, basically, with some uh, two by four and plywood bunks, you know, with the little roll-out mats on them. Just a glorified shack for sleeping to go hunting. Yeah, I mean, nothing more. You don't need more. So, they're haul ass to get here. Meanwhile, they're getting paralleled. Fred's the one in the, in the rear. And this thing is, the splashing is passing them. So, the water in this particular part of the river, he said, was at least three to four feet deep. And this thing was splashing through it like it was a puddle. Blah, 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 blah. So, the, they're shook. They are shook and, and they're motivated with their running. They all make it back to that cabin, right? As uh, soon as they get in the door and shut the door, Fred in the rear has a severe leg cramp. It's so cramped that they have to, uh, Doug and Chris have to grab him by the ankle and kind of help his leg because uh, it was trying to it was trying to bend up and lock up on him. Ah, oh, ah, oh, jeez, jeez, ah, oh, that kind of cramp that would just suck so bad. So they're tending to Fred. They hear splashing out in the river, and then a moment later they hear something whap hit hit the door of this cabin and when this thing hit the door it it, it dawned on them that this isn't a very safe place right 
immediately they let go of Fred's leg. He's on his own with his crap. You know, this asshole just wing shots at this, and that's why we're here. That's a anyway. So they look out the window to see what the hell just hit the cabin, right? And what it ended up being was this uh, huge clump of grass that was a uh, eroded overhang. And it was basically, you know, have you ever worked with sod? It was similar to sod, but a big chunk with more dirt and rock stuck to the bottom and then the grass out the top, right? So this huge thing had hit the door very hard. Uh, it must have weighed uh, 60 pounds, this big chunk of earth that was chucked at the cabin. So now they're looking for it. Now inside the cabin, they have a shotgun and they have a couple other big bore rifles. So immediately they're getting the big boy guns out. You know, no more 22s for Fred. And so he gets his cramp worked out, and they're all looking out the windows. Now, it's it's not dark yet, but they know darkness is coming. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to draw this out. I'm trying to I'm trying to be thorough and and get all these little nuances in. So time goes by and and they're getting very uneasy because it's dead, dead quiet. Dead quiet. And so they don't want to stay. Now they have a little bit of a ways to go before the trail that will lead a few miles to where they had parked their rig to get out of there. So they, they, it's, if you got something that big chasing you, you don't want to be on that kind of journey. You don't even want to be on a 10 foot journey, let alone a couple miles through the Alaskan wilderness with this thing pissed off. So they're, they're, they're looking at their options. We got food, we got shelter, we got ammo here. We're good. We'll, we'll, we'll hold out. If, if, keeps us in here someone will eventually come but we can defend this place you know there was uh three windows in the place one on each of the walls and then there was a, a narrow window next to the doorway and it was a solid steel door and they had some kind of a bear deterrent nail boards and stuff that they would put over the windows and on the door to keep bears from breaking in and get tearing up their shit so they had all that bear board stuff stacked in a neat way right outside the door against uh, part of the windbreak of the porch. And right where it particularly had to be was the stairway down to the ground. And so when you went out, you know, you had to kind of step around all these bear boards. So they decide, well, let's, we got these guns. Screw this thing. Let's kill it. That's what, they, that's what they're thinking. We're going we're gonna to kill it and get the hell out of here. And then we'll get help and then come back, you know. Uh, Cause it was big. When they saw it moving, uh, he said he could. He didn't want to guess the size, but he said it was massive, uh, massively tall. He guesstimated because he only saw it in the water really well when it was standing in the river, and and the water was just above its knees. And he thinks that that particular spot was at least four to five feet deep where it was standing, and it was barely up just past its knees of this creature. So. At this at this particular point, it went from it through the it through the uh, clump of grass. They freak, you know, all that. They check it out. They all armed up. Moments later, during their discussion, uh, it was Doug looking out the narrow window out the front door that that looks down to the river. When they saw it standing in the water, and that's when they all went over and played. You know, Tommy took a look out the window. So <laughs> they realize they kind of size up what they're dealing with. They said, you know, we're going to kill it. They go out, you know. And I'll bring up the bear boards because it comes into play in just a moment. So they go out, and, and there's, you know, a good gap in between these bear boards and the stairway because it's a 36-inch wide stairway, right? So they get, you know, easily get by it. And as they're they're sitting there going down discussing well, which direction they go because it was no longer standing in the river, it, it was nowhere in sight. It was just, just gone. So they're standing out there a moment. Now, at this point, it is starting to get to dusk. And in the trees, it's, it's really dark shadows, but there's still plenty of daylight up in the sky and, you know, in the grass and stuff. But anything in the tree line is damn near pitch black. So they figure out, okay, it must have ran over in the trees. So, you know, Doug with the shotgun, wing, wing, wing some rounds over into those trees. Let's see if we can get it to move. Everyone be sure we don't shoot accidentally shoot each other. So they're standing kind of shoulder to shoulder so they don't swing into the, each other's fire. Great plan, right? He lets a couple shots off across the river. Boom, boom. Not a sound. Not a sound. Not a sound. 
they hear nothing. So they decide, well, maybe we'll, we'll use one of the big bore rifles and wing a shot a little further down the trees that way. Let's see if we can coax it out. It came before with gunshots. Let's see if we'll do it again. Boom! Shoots a round off. They hear something behind them. Something coming from behind the cabin. So they turn around immediately and they're, they're looking because the, the cabin's elevated. It, it's about a foot and a half in the front elevated and it kind of drops off a little bit so it's up to about two and a half, three foot on the pilings in the back, right? So they could bend down and look underneath the whole place. And they do that and they see nothing. They, they see nothing that would have made the noise that smacked or hit hit the cabin. So they figure, oh, it's throwing stuff like it did at the creek. Yeah, it, it threw something and it landed on, on the cabin and that's what got our attention. Okay, okay, this thing's smart. So they, you know, they think they got it figured out. They turn around, they're looking for the direction this thing, whatever was thrown. And they hear that noise again, right? And they they ignore it because they think they're being tricked. They think they're being tricked that something's making that noise intentionally to distract their attention that way while it does something in front of them. So they want to be ready. They're not falling for it. They're not dumb. So, you know, they're, they're doing their thing. They hear a scream across the river, just like they thought, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, it's right over there. We're, we'll try to pinpoint it, put another big caliber rifle around, straight that direction. You're not going to hit it. It's going to hit a tree, but shoot it that direction. You know, let them know we mean business, right? Wings the shot. They hear another noise behind them at the cabin. They're ignoring that noise at the cabin. Ignoring it. We're not falling for that crap. We, we know it's over here. So, Doug, who, who operated the shotgun, had it, re, you know, a couple more rounds put back in that bad boy. He decides, I'm done with this. The shotgun short range. I'll go inside and wait. He turns around to go just short distance to the stairs up the walkway. The bear boards were all turned, nails facing out, leaned up, and stacked up kind of in front of the door. This thing distracted them because they were smart, went and turned the bear boards around, nails sticking out to stop them from getting back into that freaking cabin. Ugh. What? Like, like, dude, dude, yeah. So when they saw that, the realization was, we're being freaking played. Well, guess what? They didn't go back in the cab. They took their fucking happy asses with the ammo they had and the guns they had going in the dark and like three soldiers hiked the fuck out of there. Uh, they, they said they, they, Thought they sounded, it sounded like they were being paralleled a couple different times. They would fire off a volley of shots. Now, they're doing this. It's going in the darkness. They got no gear other than their guns and a bunch of ammo they threw in their pockets to accost this thing. And, and they're getting the hell out of Dodge. They went, it, it's a, accumulated uh, about three and a half miles to go from where this particular cabin was through the Muskeg and the trails and the black spruce on into higher ground then lower ground, then higher ground, up into where they parked the truck, right? Troopers, they did it. They, they stomped out. Uh, the main reason I'm going to share that with you is, one, it's like, holy crap, but the cunning. Like, turn the bear boards around? Dude, that's genius. <laughs> Keep them from being able to run back in easily. Like, wow. You know? Um, just Wow. Like, what do you what do you do in a situation like that? What do you what can we make of that? Like that that's just on some other level. That that's kind of like imitating the baby crying, luring my cousin Elizabeth out. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna prey on a woman's uh, instinct and nature to lure him out, dude, dude. Uh, I don't. There, there's more going on with these things. Uh, there's uh, we know they're smart. We know they're very smart, but I think they're smarter and, and just as cunning as we are. They just go about it in a different way because we live in a different world. Not, not you know, ooh, oh, yeah, they come out of a portal. No, the woods being the different world. They're there 24-7. I'm sure they've been around. Who knows how long they live, what they've seen. So they knew, and this thing knew enough 
I'm assuming it was one distracted by one. Another one did something. I, I don't know. They didn't they didn't see it, but they they heard the noises and they ignored it. <laughs> I tell you what, Chris, Doug and Fred, they will never ignore a noise behind them again. And I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just like, can you imagine? Your escape is right there. You feel your safety's right there. And lo and behold, it's turned on you. You got you got this uh, this man made porcupine facing you to get in the door. Oh jeez, man. Well, uh, they still go there. Uh, this was just two three years ago. I think he said uh, not not very long ago. Be safe when you go, bro, and keep the bare boards somewhere else to where you don't get porcupined out of your own damn cabin when you got one of these things ticked off at you because your buddy wants to wing shots at it. I, I'm not making light of it. Me and him laughed about it on the phone conversation, so take no offense, buddy. I, I, I mean no disrespect. It's just holy shit. What do you do with that? You, I'm sure this these guys will never... <laughs> Never look at bare boards the same again. Oh, jeez. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. Sorry for laughing at you guys. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm picturing this and it's just so fucked up to have, <laughs> to think you're going to kill this thing and all of a sudden this mother, it's behind you just setting a trap for you. Oh, jeez. Oh, be safe out there, guys. We'll talk to you later.